I can pick them up. We'll just move this one. No, we'll move the microphones forward. Here. We'll move it here. Because the kids will be right after the worship team. After our second song, the worship team could just move it like this.
morning. He is risen. He is risen. The Lord is risen. Let's all stand as we worship the Lord. Welcome, welcome to Woodbridge Community Church. This is our time for us to declare that He is able, He is risen from the grave, and He can do all the things that He's planning to do in us, through us, and through this church. God is able. Let's sing this. what we put our faith on. Lots of things are being spoken or tell the story here in this world, but this is the greatest story. 
this is historical and he has risen from the grave and let's put our life on that story because he rose from the grave blessings to you all let's sing this song
point of that is your resurrection from the grave. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you and we bow down before you. Lord, thank you because we know our kids who worship you here as well. Bless our children in Jesus' name. Amen. the oldest so we're going to have our children lead us in a worship song this morning so we're so excited they're going to be here with us leading us through this song because church is for everyone amen he is risen for everyone amen
Can we give our kids another round of applause? Great job. Thank you for leading us in worship and leading us today in song. Thank you. Thank you. At this moment, we would love to be here, and thank you that you're here. Turn to someone next to you. And what day is it? Happy Easter. Say happy Easter to someone next to you. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to Woodbridge Community Church. If today is your first time, what a special day. You know, we try to give a little snapshot of what church is like. So thank you, thank you for being here. Special welcome to everyone. Wasn't that great just to be led in worship out of the mouth of babes just leading us in worship today. So if it is your first time here, we would love to get connected with you. There's so many things besides just Sunday that we do here at Woodbridge Community Church. So there's a connect card right in front of you and a free gift at the Welcome Center. We'd love to connect with you and get you plugged into a lot of the growth groups and small groups that's going on. And, and there's also a QR code if you are online as well, if you wanna snap that. We'd love to get you connected and get you plugged in and all the many things that's going on here at Woodbridge Community Church. Welcome this Easter. It's so great to be worshiping with you guys. Now, if, if um, giving and tithes is part of your worship, we do have that online and in the back as well. So we're so thankful for the ways that you've been giving. and It allows us to do ministries like these children's ministries, these missions and abroad, and all the great ways that this church is impacting not just locally, but globally all over the world. So many ways that your contribution and giving is giving to that. Also, next week, we're starting a brand new series. It's a special Bible study that Pastor Mike Cranford's doing right after service at 12.15. It is um, growing through the Spirit in the book of Acts. We love to invite you there as well. If that's something that you want to grow in and be a part of right after service, starting on April 7th, that's something that you can be part partnered with in with Pastor Mike Cranford. All right? Well, at this time, you know, we're going to enter back into worship. But before we do, we're introducing this new song. You know, as the kids are dismissed and they've gone already, there's a song here called Sunday is Coming. And we thought, what a great way for us to introduce this new song than by meditating on the words and reading it together. So I want to invite us, you know, we're going we're gonna to stand and as we sing this song together, but before we do, can we meditate on what these lyrics were, are meaning and the words behind them? Can we do that? And as we're reading through these words, I invite you just to think through what they mean as it tells the story of Jesus, tells the story of his resurrection and his death and the purpose behind it. A great light dawns in Galilee. Some say madman, some say king. A wonder-working rebel priest, Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Because he knew well what it would take to free us all from sin and grave. A perfect man would have to die and only he could pay that price. Friday's good because Sunday is coming. Don't lose hope because Sunday is coming. Devil, you're done. You better start running because Friday's good because Sunday is coming. So he let those soldiers take him in as his friend betrayed him with a kiss. And there before the mocking crowd, like a lamb to the slaughter, did it make a sound. Then he carried that cross to Calvary, and he shed his blood to set us free. As the nails went in, the sky went dark. The redemption of the world was on his heart. Then he breathed his last, and he bowed his head. The Son of God and man was dead. With bloody hands and tears on his face, they laid him down inside that grave. 
But that wasn't the end. That wasn't the end. That wasn't the end. Let me tell you what happened next. The women came before the dawn to find that stone already gone. And when they looked inside, the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's alive. He's alive. Hallelujah. He's alive. Give him praise. Lift him high. Hallelujah. He's alive. And they said, he's alive. He's alive. Hallelujah. He's alive. Give him praise and lift him high. Hallelujah. He's alive. Now Jesus reigns upon the throne. All heaven sings to him alone. We watch and wait like a bride for the groom. Oh, church, arise. He's coming soon. So church, would you arise as we sing this song? Continue reflecting that those words while Josh is setting up. This is it. This is the message we have. Josh, lead us in this worship song.
you. Holy is your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen and you're coming soon. Thank you, God, for coming into this broken and sinful world through your son. You lived with us. This is the God we know, the God that just didn't stay there in your holiness, but went and lived among us. Who are we, Lord, that you would care for us that much? I still don't understand that, Lord. We still don't understand that. But what I know and have seen is you did this because of your great love. Because you are the ultimate love and you're the ultimate good. You lived with us as a common fellow. Not only that, but you had a mission to save us from this broken and sin-stricken world. Thus, you died for our sins and cleansed us and made us righteous before you through your son if we believe in you. Hallelujah. Now you have settled it. It is accomplished and finished. You have risen from the grave. You are now seated on the right hand of the Father, sovereignly ruling. Now we wait for your coming return. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, empower us to be your servants and ambassadors of this good news story. Let us declare it in Irvine, in Orange County, and in the whole United States, and to the ends of the earth. We are watching and waiting. O oh, Woodbridge Church, O oh, Universal Church, O oh, Body of Christ, arise, for you are coming soon. Speak to us once more, Lord, through your servant, Pastor Frank. In Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. Amen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. 
Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. On the count of three, we're all going to say amen. Ready? One, two, three. Amen. Stand with me, would you, this morning. Welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Easter Sunday. What does this day mean to you and to me? The scriptures, let me go back 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 53, verses 9 and 10 says, He's a grave. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And, th- and, through, and though the Lord makes a, a life an offering of her sin, right? And through the Lord makes him a offering for sin and he will see, God the Father will see his offspring, prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. No one who believes in me will, will live even though they die, will live even though they die. Frank, help me to speak this morning. I'm so stoked. <laughs> How about this one? Did you know Jesus prayed for you? After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and says, Father, the hour has come. Come, glorify your son. Your son may glorify you. For you've granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who you have given him. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of your son, Jesus. Of all Sundays, this one is extra special. Of all Sundays, Lord, our minds race back to what this Sunday means. What happened 2,000 years ago and what that means for us today, collectively and individually, We ask, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon this place this this morning, Lord. Lord, people don't need to hear me speak, but we all need to hear Christ speak to us today. So Jesus of Nazareth, you are the son of the living God. Come and walk among us. Jesus, you're the one that says that your people will hear your voice and they will follow you. We're listening, Lord, this morning. We pray, Lord God, that you would just open our eyes that we might see today. We pray, Lord, that you would open our ears that we might hear today. We pray, Lord God, that your kingdom would be proclaimed and people would leave with better understanding of who you are and what you mean for us. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ would say, Amen. Amen. So this Sunday is a very special Sunday. Y'all may be seated. So um, afterwards, we have 15 people being baptized. And yeah, really cool. Um, We have a group called Team Elijah that's right now praying against the rain, that it will not rain. And so uh, this is going to be pretty cool. We're going to have a very special day today. And we just want to welcome you here. So my, hey man, if you're new here, uh, welcome to Woodbridge Community Church. My name is Frank Winans. I'm the senior pastor here. And uh, we're just so glad you're here. Uh, We're all on this journey to meet Jesus, to know Jesus, and to follow Jesus. That's why we exist. We're a church that exists for the very purpose of trying to help people meet Jesus. And not just meet him, but to know him. 
And our prayers is that all of us would learn to follow him and trust him with our lives. So welcome to uh, Woodbridge Community Church and our Easter Sunday morning service. A question, so I, as we get rolling today, I need to ask you a question. I want you to think of a time in your life when you personally was really surprised or shocked at something that happened to you. I want you to think back. Can, if someone was to ask you, what was some events in your life that happened to you that totally shocked you, that radically surprised you, and in the process of that, affected how you lived your life. Can you think of anything like that in your own journey? For example, and I hate this, so for me personally, I hate the rain. Every time it rains, I'm so grateful for the home that we live in right now. Because the home that we had, our first house, uh, we had roof problems. True story. I remember sleeping one night and water started dripping on my forehead of all places where my home was gonna leak and my roof was to bust, it was in our bedroom on on my side of the bed as water was dripping on my forehead at about 2.30 at night. And I woke up like, what is this? And guess what? That radically changed how I was planning on living my life from that moment. I'm I'm getting up, I've, what a mess, right? Oh, Oh, how about this one? This one qualifies. Have you ever been driving down the 405 freeway and the hood comes back and smashes into your windshield. Has this ever happened to you before? Because it's happened to me. And it's quite in, uh, interesting. If you look closely, that's his MacArthur Boulevard. People, you're driving down the, the 405. Everything's fine. You're going 70 miles an hour. <whistles> listening to the radio. In an instant, the hood breaks loose, flies back, smacks the windshield. You blink. Because, by the way, it's quite shocking and you blink. And then when you open your eyes, you can't see. You're going, still going 70 miles an hour down the freeway. But no longer can you see the freeway because there's a hood now in front of you. And the windshield's cracked. And you're trying to figure out what do you do next. That's called shocking. That was a surprise that I got to live made my heart stop. How about you? Did anything ever happen in your life? One moment this, the next moment that? Maybe it's a, a national event. Remember 9-11? Do you guys remember 9-11? Many of us in this room weren't born. Uh, we were born after 9-11, but for many of us, this day nationally radically shocked our world. Amen? And changed the way we live. I know every, every Christmas, you know, we like watching... Um, Uh, Home Alone, you know? And you always see in those movies before 9-11, people running through the airport. Did you know you can't do that anymore? Because who's stopping you? TSA. And you got to take off your shoes. I mean, right after this, somebody had put some bombs. They were trying to light their shoes on an airplane and blow it up. So now we all have to take off our shoes. You no longer can go up and see people getting off the airplane. It radically changed. This was a shocking event. All of us that were alive at the time can tell about what we were thinking and what we were seeing. Not just hearing about the first one, but the second one. Many of us saw it radically shocking. I have, uh, I, hey dad. So my dad's watching online today. My dad's 97 years old. My, my uh, father, uh, I've asked him, Dad, what was some of the most shocking things that you ever had? He said, Frankie, I remember as a little boy, I was in upstate New York. It's like 15, 16 years old, and I was hearing that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Here's a picture of this. He says, back then there was new TV, so I'm hearing on the radio that our country had been attacked. And I knew that if this war didn't end soon, I would be drafted, in which he was. And he had, his life was radically changed. He was shocked to hear that his country had been attacked. He was shocked in the next year seeing people that he knew graduating from high school and immediately being drafted into the military at, at his, in upstate New York, at his little town that he grew up in. There's a plaque there, and it has all the kids from the, town that went and fought in the war and there's little asterisks to the ones that all of them that died and my dad's in there at the age of 17 and a half he went and joined the navy didn't see it coming shocking 
Huh. This, so, I want you, want you to think this morning of in your journey of life, what were the things that happened to you that was so surprising, so shocking, you didn't see it come, radically changed your life. This morning, my wife and I were talking about a young man that was in my youth group. His, his, his name was Travis. And he married this beautiful lady. Um, they went to USC together. They married, and then they found out that they couldn't have children. And so they ended up adopting two daughters from uh, Sudan. And, and then, I think it's like 12 years into their marriage, he came home one day, and his wife was pregnant. And there's actually a beautiful video of her uh, telling him, and he was like, what? And he was totally shocked. And it's so cool to see their Christmas pictures now. Because there's my, this kid in my youth group, and, I was, and his wife, and their, their two daughters from Sudan, whom's theirs, and then their biological little girl. Shocking! Do you know life is filled with things that happened to us we didn't see it coming? Shocking! If we could sit in a room and just begin to tell our stories, what's the top three for you? If we could just sit in a room and begin talking about things that happened to our life that we didn't see it coming, that radically impacted our lives. If we were to do that this morning, and then we had people from the first century come and sit in our table, and then they began telling their story about the resurrection, their story would blow yours away. Would blow my stories away. There's no story I could tell that would totally top the stories of the people that were eyewitnesses of the event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They were witnesses to the stunning event that ripples, that shakes the very bones of humanity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I wonder what their stories would be if we could somehow bring people back and they could sit here on stage and they could tell us their stories. What would they say? Who were the people that were shocked by the resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years ago? If you're going to take notes of me this morning, you're welcome to do that. Uh, Here's a first note I want you to write down. People that were first shocked by the resurrection of Jesus, the soldiers guarding the tomb were the first ones shocked on a Sunday morning. What was going on in the minds of the Roman soldiers that early Sunday morning? Try to put your mind, try to think what what was going on in their life heading up to that moment. They all know that they've been ordered to guard this tomb, right? Right? They know that this Jesus, this body that they're guarding, is some religious leader that came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They all knew that. They all know that he's some kind of miracle worker who has issues with the religious leaders who somehow got involved politically with their boss, Pontius Pilate. They all know that Pilate, their boss, had him flogged, scourged, and crucified. They probably know that their own contingent that was at the Praetorian uh, were the part of beating up Jesus. They know that there's a seal of Caesar placed on it. And they've been told they, somebody might try to steal the body. And that's why we're here. That ain't going to happen. That's their job. And there they are guarding that tomb Saturday night in the Sunday morning. Matthew 28, 2 through 4. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning, (laughs) and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. That's called shock. 
They were never trained to deal with this. Amen? Think about that. Put that one on a shelf. What would their story be? Or how about the women that came to the tomb that early morning? Write that note now. Here's another group. The women coming to take care of the body. What was going on in their minds that morning? They're totally still traumatized from what happened on Good Friday. Many of them probably can't believe that Jesus is dead because they've seen him do miracles. How can the miracle man die? Their master's gone. And not only is he gone, but he's been tortured and murdered. So it's, it's after the Passover, and they come now back to the tomb, and they're going to try to somehow ask the guards to open it up so they can prepare Jesus' body more properly for burial because it was hastily done. Mark chapter 16, 1 through 8. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He's arisen. Amen, right? He's not here. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? Look. But go tell his disciples, and Peter, interesting, and he... And he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you, trembling and bewildered. What would you be doing? Trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's called shock. They came looking for a dead man, thought his body was stolen, ending up seeing angels who said that Jesus is alive. Can you imagine the range of emotions on that one? The span of emotional spectrum. To say the least, their, their morning isn't going like they thought it would be, right? So put that one, you got, the, you got the soldiers, how about that one? Put that one up, up there, right? Or how about Peter and the apostles? Oh man. Note number three, Peter and the apostles. What do you think they were thinking early Sunday morning? I know what they were thinking. This is what they were thinking. We're losers. We're losers. You know what? We showed the Passion of the Christ here on, on, on Good Friday. Powerful movie. Poor Peter denies Jesus three times and then is so ashamed of himself that he's gone. I know what they were thinking on Sunday morning. We are complete losers. We bailed on him. We publicly denied him. One of our own betrayed him and us and then committed suicide, Judas, right? They're hiding. They're afraid. Maybe they're going to come and kill us next. They're ashamed. They're a total mess. That's what's happening in their mind. It's Sunday morning. And who shows up? In Luke 24, 9 through 12, it says this. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the others with them who told this to the disciples. And what did they tell them? Um, The body's gone. The tomb's rolled back and we saw an angel. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself 
what the stink is happening, right? That's called shock, people. Did the religious leaders steal his body? Where's the guards? Angels? Wow. Could it be? Guards, the women, the apostles? How about the religious leaders? This one's interesting. The religious leaders were totally a part of this. What were they thinking that Sunday morning? I know what they were thinking. Caiaphas, the high priest, Anna, Annas, who is the ex-high priest, they're good buddies. The Sanhedrin, they're all thinking, we made it. Jesus is gone. The feast of Passover has come and gone. The 150 to 250,000 pilgrims that have come to Jerusalem for Passover is now leaving today. We made it. Time to relax. That was a tough week last week. But we politically did our best. And we got rid of this Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Matthew 28. 11 through 15, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. What did they just tell him? Some angel showed up and rolled away the stone. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say that his disciples came during the night, stole him away while we were asleep. By the way, if that happened, the Romans would be murdered or killed because that's you're on guard duty. If you fell asleep in guard duty, that's a death sentence, right? If this report gets to your boss, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Politicians. A necessary evil? I don't know. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. People, I would have loved to have seen the look on Caiaphas' face as the soldiers told him what happened. They would have went, no. Right? People, it isn't over. It's just begun. Their worst fears have totally come to pass. Their arch enemy, the one that they publicly, that the, the one that called them hypocrites has come up out of the grave. The miracle man from Galilee, Yeshua of Nazareth, has pulled off the miracle. He's alive. Can it be? How do we handle this? That's called shock. They're dealing with it too. The empty tomb of Jesus of Nazareth is the shocking event in human history that has radical implications for all of us. The shock back then spanned his closest followers to his most hated enemies. Both couldn't believe what was going on that early Sunday morning. And yet by the end of the first Easter day, it was pretty obvious to all of them what was going on. Here's the point. There's no tomb. There's no grave. There's no cross. There is no Roman soldier big enough or strong enough to stop the work of Jesus Christ. It, right? Do it, right? Do it, one, two, three, ready? Amen. 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 It's true, people. He came out in power. This is who our Jesus is. That Sunday morning, there was sightings, not just of the empty tomb, but of the resurrected Savior. It, was, it wasn't just the tomb's empty. Dude, I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. I, the, the women at the well, right? Poor Mary, Magdalene. She's totally freaking out. She tells the apostles... She runs back to the tomb. She's by herself. She's trying to get a handle on this. Am I crazy, she's probably thinking. Am I seeing things? She goes back to the tomb, and who explains it to her? John chapter 20, 11 through 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. 
As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw now not one, but two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she says, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Last time she she saw Jesus, he'd been whooped pretty good, people. And now he's standing there looking really good. And with a new, brand new body, resurrected body. 1 Corinthians 15, check that out. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And Jesus says to her, Mary, right? And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, rabbi, or teacher. She got it. <laughs> Can you imagine? Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me. So what did Mary do, people? You ever gotten a bear hug lately? Because all of a sudden there's Jesus getting one of these. And she's just holding on and she's, she isn't going to let go, right? Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and said to tell to my brothers and tell them I'm, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went back to the disciples. Now it's no longer the tomb's empty. She runs back now going, I've seen him. And she starts telling him, he's alive. We're beginning to get a comprehension of what's going on, Right? And there's the disciples in the room hearing this. And they're starting to go, what? And then somebody pops in to explain it to them. Do you know who it was? Luke chapter 24, 36 through 44. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. People, ghost doesn't have flesh and bone as you see that I have. And when he has said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement. So they are completely in shock, people. He asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Can you imagine all of them just staring at him? Do you think he really had to eat? I don't think so. I think he's like, watch this. (laughs) Do you hate it when people watch you eat? Staring at you? They probably didn't even blink. They're just looking at him and he's just quietly eating a piece of fish. I bet he was having so much fun. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. Check this out. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Bible. In Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms, everything that was said about me has to come to pass. Why are you guys surprised? Shock, confusion. Ah, now I'm getting it. People driving down the freeway. (whistles) Wham! I can't see. The hood came out. I can't. How am I get? I mean, it, your brain starts trying to comprehend what's going on. They are beginning to get it. They're beginning to understand. Confusion. Do you think the soldiers began to understand what had happened to them that morning? Has anyone ever seen the movie Risen? Really good movie. Can I encourage you this week to watch the movie Risen? It's a great movie about uh, what the Romans would have had to do like the week after Jesus had come up out of the grave. Great movie. Do you think the soldiers had, were figuring it out? Absolutely. How about the chief priests and the religious leaders? Shock, confusion, 
they began to realize what had happened. And if you read the book of Acts, which we're about to study here in our next series, the, the apostles begin explaining it to them in detail with power and signs and wonders. Jesus is alive, people. The religious leaders totally get what had happened to him. All of us in this room have had a shocking event that's happened to us. And if we all sat in a room and told our stories, and then we had them come and sit among us, I'm telling you straight up, they're going to blow your story away. I don't care what you've seen or what you've experienced. They were eyewitnesses to the shocking event in human history that shakes the very foundations of humanity, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We at this church exist to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, I, I, I think um, like out like in the seat right in front of you, there's this thing called your spiritual journey. I don't know if you have one of these. I'm going to shoot this up. I love this. This is something that I want you all to grab one of these. We have a bunch of them in the back. You can take it. You can look at it. Go home and think about this because here's the deal. I'm a reformed atheist. We exist. People don't come up out of the grave, do they? Just, I'm a scientist. I'm a person of reason. <laughs> this is a really cool tool. Searching, following. Uh, when you look at it, there's a, a guy over here saying, dude, I'm not interested. Shoot it up. Yeah, dude, I'm not interested. I'm aware, but but not very interested, okay for you, but it's not for me. Many misconceptions about Christianity, negative views of Christianity and religion, believes all religions are the same, has an indifference attitude towards spiritual issues. Totally me. Then realizing there, are more, there is more to life than what is seen, attends Christian events out of curiosity, not because of need, struggles with negative images of Christianity, questions the belief that all religions lead to the same God. Searching, curiously searching. Then how about searching assertively? Takes steps to find needed answers. Intellectually believes that there might be a God. Moves from an atheist to an agnostic. Anyone? There might be a God. There might be a design to the universe. Do you guys see design in the human body? <clears throat> is, is there a designer? That's a step, right? Act, searching actively, and then finally coming to a place of going, you got to be kidding me. It's real. There's a group of people today, we're, we're going to be baptized. These are people that are, I publicly confess my faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. It's a big deal, Right? And then you experience new life. That means you're born again. The children sang that beautiful song about being born again, right? And you begin to grow in your spiritual journey. You start living with a new mission and a new purpose in life. This is a really cool tool. Please take this home. Where are you on your journey with Jesus? On that chart, where are you? I've traveled on that chart. All of us is there somewhere. We're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Where are you on the journey of meeting Jesus and knowing Jesus and following Jesus? Where are you on the journey of meeting Jesus and knowing Jesus and following Jesus? And that's the next note. I want you to, that's a note for you. And I'd just love for you to answer this between you and you. Where are you on the journey of understanding what the resurrection of Jesus means for your life? Write that down. Where are you on this card? <laughs> so as a young man in my early 20s, I picked up a Bible, began reading the Gospels of Jesus. Because any intelligent person should at least read Jesus. Amen? Even if you don't believe in him, at least read him. Why? Why? Because he's the most influential person in human history. Why not be educated? Why not? 
Why not just be intelligent and turn off Netflix and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Just read Jesus. So I did. I did as a skeptic. Began reading Jesus. Began, I actually like Jesus. I've yet to meet somebody who's read Jesus. Don't let somebody tell you about Jesus. Go figure him out yourself, please. Come on, man. How many years are you going to live on planet Earth? Don't waste your life. If there is a God, figure him out. Open up the Bible and read it yourself. You're smart. Go read Jesus. Just read Jesus and tell me what you think about him. Because I know what I'm like. Hey, I actually like the guy. I see him some kind of a religious reformer, a zealot. I kind of like that he's tough and he stands up against oppression and yet he's humble. I kind of like this dude, Jesus. I don't know if I like Christians. Still haven't really gone to church yet, but I'm reading Jesus and drinking beer. I was doing both and smoking a cigarette, reading Jesus. I wish you could have seen me in my early 20s in a cabin in Big Bear trying to figure this out. I like him. And the story happens true. I was working on a construction crew, building houses. See, so I, could, I worked on my roof when it was leaking. I actually went up on the roof. Hey, actually, I had help, though. Thanks, Dad. Um, read Jesus. Asked this guy that was telling me about Jesus, how, why do you believe what you believe? How do you know what you believe is true? I was expecting him to say, because I have faith. And I was like, man, so do I. As an atheist, I have faith. There's nothing. I was expecting him to say, well, I have faith. And he says, Frank, that's a great question. Go read Isaiah 53. What's that? It's in the Old Testament, prophet, book of Isaiah. You guys all need to read it. I read it. When you read the prophet Isaiah, it says that this Righteous one, my servant, will be rejected by his people, will be pierced through for the transgressions of others, will be scourged or flogged, and by his stripes you're healed. All of us has gone astray, each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of our sins to fall upon this person. He will be silent before his accusers. His grave will be assigned with wicked men. Yet in a rich man's tomb... Isaiah 53.10 says this, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. That God the Father's, it was actually God the Father's will for Jesus to suffer. And through this, this person's gonna make an offering for sin. God the Father will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in the hands of this individual. How does somebody die and yet their days are prolonged? How does that happen? Anyone? The prophecy is 700 years before Jesus was born that this individual will die for the iniquities of my people and yet his life is prolonged. That's called resurrection from the dead. He's alive. Amen. It's prophecy. It's prophecy. For me, reading this, this was, the, this was the water dripping on my forehead. What is this? My journey. For me, not wanting to believe. This was me driving down the freeway and the hood smashing into the windshield. What is that? And when I first read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, I had gotten a huge argument with these people over when this was written, because it's clearly Jesus. So it had to been written after. And they're telling me it was written before. By the way, it's written before. It's historical proof. Here is the truth of all this. This Jesus coming up out of the grave is not mythology. It is prophetic historical truth. Let that sink in. It's real. And it means everything. It means everything, people. It means everything to you, and it means everything to me. In the last five months, I've had some really good friends of mine pass away. People I can close my eyes and see them in my mind. 
Where do you go when you die? See, here's my deal. My origin is, is I'm an accident. I come from nothing. Over billions of years of time and chance, I just evolved. And because that's true, what's the meaning to my life? I really struggle. There is no meaning. There's no intrinsic value to my existence. If you're an accident, then what is the intrinsic meaning of your existence? There's none. Morals are relative, and when you die, you cease to exist. That's my worldview. And then all of a sudden, I began doing one of these, coming down the line, and Jesus totally starts speaking into my life. Frankie, you're not an accident. You're made in the image of God. No way. The, you have a meaning and purpose on this life because I that created you give you meaning and purpose, really. Morals aren't just something you create. They're fixed in the eyes of the creator. And when you die, Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in? Paradise. Jesus hung on that cross because all of us are sinners, Do you know that even you have a moral boundary of who you choose to hang out with? All of you in this room has a moral boundary on who you choose to hang out with or not hang out with. If somebody steals from you, do you want to be hanging out with them? If someone speaks poorly of you, do you want to hang out with them? If somebody murdered your cousin, do you want to hang out with them? Why? Where does that come from? Somehow you, even you, have a boundary of what's right and wrong. That's all because you're made in the image of God. God is a moral being and you are a moral being. God's moral being is so above yours. And not only is he moral, he's just. See, if any of you create a crime, if you commit a crime, what is the punishment of your crime? If you sin against God, What's the punishment of your sinning against God? If all of you murdered somebody, there's laws and you have to pay for the crime. Even now, we in a broken, fallen humanity. Here's the deal. All of you, including me, has offended God in how we behave. We are morally bankrupt compared to God. Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and just three out of ten, don't lie, don't steal, and honor your father and mother. Has anyone in here ever lied? Raise your hand. If you've never lied, raise your hand. You're a liar. God sets up a moral boundary. We all fall short, people You need Jesus. You know what he did for you on this cross? He took all the stuff that you do that offends a holy God and all the stuff that you do that puts you in a place of eternal separation from God. Jesus takes your punishment upon himself on the cross. By his wounds you are healed. You are the transgressor of these laws. Jesus is the one that pays the debt for your sins. And not only does he take your sin upon himself, but then he imputes to you his righteousness into your life. Because here is the big, big, big point. For God so loved the world. For God so loved you that he sent Jesus into this world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believeth upon him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The message to humanity through Jesus is God says, though you guys offend me in word, action, thought, and deed, I still love you and I want to be with you for all eternity because I created you and made you in my image and I absolutely love you. Do you know that God loves you? But, but, but see, here's the thing. It's like some stray dog comes up. Let's say some, let's say you guys are looking for a dog and this most cute little dog shows up. It's got worms all over it. There's fleas all over it. The poor thing's got poop all over it. And you want, are you bringing that dog into your house? Answer, no, you're cleaning it up first. Do you know what God's doing on the cross? He's cleaning you up. He ain't gonna let you in his house unless you've been cleaned. No one comes to the Father but through me, says Jesus. Unless the blood of Christ is applied to your life, you're not going in, according to Jesus. Is he right? This is what's so important for you. 
This thing called Resurrection Sunday and Easter Sunday, it's not just like, wow, that might be some amazing event that happened. It has radical implications for your life. You need Jesus. You, where are you on the journey? Where are you on the journey? Where are you on the journey? Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if they die. Have you moved from confusion to understanding on this critical topic? Do you understand the empty tomb in Jerusalem and what it means for humanity and for you? Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection from the dead was all predicted by Moses and the prophets hundreds of years before he was born. His life is true. His resurrection is true. His death on the cross is true. And he hung there not for him, but for for you. He pays your debt before a holy God. He purchases your ticket into paradise. Do you know him? Do you know him? Have you moved from shock to confusion to understanding on the topic? People do not leave planet Earth without thinking this one through. Do you understand? Stained glass window says, he is risen, he's not here. I love that. Do you understand? Jesus said these words as we close. The night before he died, he prayed. And after this, he said, he looked up toward heaven, he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you have granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you've given him. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. What is eternal life? What is eternal life? That you go to church? What's eternal life? That you read the Gospel of John? What is eternal life? Jesus says that you know me. Do you know him? He wants you to know him. The only one that keeps you from knowing him is you. Maybe along life's journey, now is the time for you to know Jesus. Let me pray. Father in heaven, in the name of your son Jesus, I just commit to you the sermon that I gave. Lord, I tried my best. Help me, Lord. Take the words that was just shared. I pray, Lord God, that you would send your spirit upon all of us in this room. May we all be on the journey of meeting Jesus and knowing him, and not just knowing him intellectually, but experientially, to know him as a friend, to know him as a personal savior to know him as a creator, to know him as our beloved master, to know him the way John would say that he's just the disciple whom Jesus loved, to know him as the one who loves us. I ask, Lord God, today that you would just help us, God, on this journey. And Lord, help us to lean in close in understanding to the most shocking event that's ever happened in human history. Help us, God, to understand what this event means. I pray, Lord God, for us in this room that we would be one step closer to Christ today. 
For those of us, Lord, that has said yes to Jesus, may we just celebrate and amen and amen. Lord, for all of us that on the, that, that's on the fence of faith, I pray today that you would lovingly just push them right off into your loving arms. I pray, Lord God, today that faith would come to those, that people would begin to take steps of eternal faith. Lord, may we all confess that Jesus is the Son of God. May we all confess that he's the one that hung on a cross. For me, he's the one that takes away my lying and my stealing, my dishonoring of my parents, my being a jerk all through the last years of my life, the things that I think with my mind, the things that I say that I'm so ashamed of. I know you are even more, God. Jesus, in you, wash it all away and wrap us in robes of righteousness. Wash us clean as in baptism happens, this washing of our bodies in water that just makes us feel so good, God. Lord, we're, we've worked hard and we're sweaty and we take a shower, we take a bath, we feel so much better. Lord, when we understand who Jesus is and we say yes to him, we feel so much better because we're washed. Shame is gone in Christ. Forgiveness from the cross. Redemption. You purchased us back. Lord, help us in this room to get this. Please, Lord. This I pray for your glory. I pray this in your name. All those who love the Lord would say what? He's arisen. He's risen indeed. Ah, see, huh? He's arisen. He's risen indeed. He has arisen. He hey, this is what's happening. We're, hey, we're doing baptisms out there. So this is so cool. If you want to be a part of this, it's so rad. We're going to sing a really cool song called Living Hope. I'm going to go put on my uh, baptism clothes. And outside in the courtyard, there's a gazebo there. It's actually, actually secretly a baptismal. And there are people that are going to get baptized out there. They're going to, you're going to hear their testimony of faith and we're going to dunk them. We've got 15 of them. So, and by the way, it might be that God wants us all to get baptized today in the rain. I don't know. That's pretty cool. So, hey, happy Easter. I'm so glad you guys would be with us today. I hope that this, this Sunday is just drawing you close to Christ. So thank you so much for being here. Look forward to seeing you guys out Let's there. Let's thank Pastor Frank for declaring this wonderful truth of Jesus Christ. He's risen. Let's all stand as we sing this. You know, let this song be an anthem, be a personal song for you guys. This is the wonder of the body of Christ. It's very individual. We're not individualistic, but at the same time, it's a community of people worshiping Him, touched by Jesus Christ. All right? I know you know this song. I want to hear you singing this, okay? Let's sing. How great the castle that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke. darkness, your loving kindness, tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Verse 2. i 
Let's go out there and bless our brothers and sisters who are being baptized. All staying here? Okay. There you go.
just start reading the first one? Yeah. Uh, who's first to give up? So, Mike, you got that one too, right? Okay, so. Hey, everybody, say hello, everybody, Mike. Thank you so much for watching our live stream today. We are so glad you joined us. We'd specifically like to welcome our new viewers. One of the benefits of doing church together is continuing the conversation even after the service. If you have any questions or want to get connected to a small group, go to our website and contact us. Click on the link in the description of this video. We also have a free book we'd like to send you that explains who Jesus is, which might be better able to answer some of the questions you have about the Christian faith. You can call us as well if you need prayer or if you'd like to join a small group. Our desire is to help you meet, know, and follow Jesus. Welcome to our church community. We would love to have you be a part of our family. God bless you, and thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you next week.